Hey guys, Rob Skiba here. I uh, just want to give you a quick update. I've got a new page up on testingtheglobe.com. I have not yet put it in any of the uh, menu uh, links yet. Uh, so if you want to go directly to it, um, go to testingtheglobe.com forward slash 3dmodel.html. Testingtheglobe.com forward slash 3dmodel.html. I'll take you right to this page here. And um, I just want to go over it real quick with you. I, I say right at the top here, Enoch is a slam dunk for flat earthers. I know many have strong opinions about the book of Enoch. Whatever your opinion may be on it, the fact remains it was well known to the authors of Scripture, to the point where Jude even quoted directly from it while under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. At the very least, it shows the mindset of the Hebrews, including the authors of the canonized text, confirming the belief they and the entire ancient Near East had concerning the shape and nature of the earth and its place in the cosmos. And if you've been following my work on this, you've seen this diagram, uh, as I'm sure. This is from Logos Bible Software showing the ancient Hebrew conception of the universe. This is what you got right here. Basically, you end up with a snow globe. This view was held well into the New Testament time frame, as also indicated by the writings of Josephus. He was a first century uh, Jewish Roman historian. He wrote in the first century uh, in uh, Antiquity of the Jews, chapter 1, uh, I believe it is Antiquity, book 1, chapter 1, the constitution of the world and the disposition of the elements. And this is where he gives his account of uh, what's written in the Torah in the book of Genesis. He says, <clears throat> in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But when the earth did not come into sight, but was covered with thick darkness and a wind moved upon its face, God commanded that there should be light. And when that was made, he considered the whole mass and separated the light and the darkness. And the name he gave to one was night and the other he called day. And he named the beginning of light and the time of rest, the evening and the morning. And this was indeed the first day. But Moses said it was one day, the cause of which I am able to give even now. But because I have promised to give such reasons for all things in a treatise by itself, I shall put off this exposition till that time. After this, on the second day, he placed the heaven over the whole world and separated it from the other parts, and he determined it should stand by itself. He also placed a crystalline firmament around it and put it together in a manner agreeable to the earth, and fitted it for giving moisture and rain, and for affording the advantage of dews. On the third day, he appointed the dry land to appear, and the sea itself round about it. And on the very same day, he made the plants and the seeds to spring out of the earth. On the fourth day, he adorned the heaven with the sun, the moon, and the other stars, and appointed them their motions and courses, that the vicissitudes of the seasons might be clearly signified. The early church fathers also wrote quite a bit about this crystalline firmament, but that's a topic for a whole other essay. Okay, this is what really got me, though. Check out how the author of First Enoch describes the flood as given through the vision dream of Enoch prior to the judgment occurring. Enoch had been given some visions and dreams. This particular one was like an allegorical dream, sort of like... Um, animal farm where uh, people were animals and different types of animals represented different types of people and and the watchers and uh, nephilim and all that and uh when he gets to the part of describing the coming judgment this is what he said in chapter 89 and again i raised mine eyes toward heaven and saw a lofty roof a lofty roof with seven water torrents thereon and those torrents flowed with much water into an enclosure and I saw again, and behold, fountains were opened on the surface of that great enclosure, and that water began to swell and rise upon the surface. And I saw that enclosure till all its surface was covered with water. And the water, the darkness, and mist increased upon it. And as I looked at the height of that water, that water had risen above the height of that enclosure and was streaming over that enclosure, and it stood upon the earth. And all the cattle of that enclosure were gathered together until I saw how they sank and were swallowed up and perished in that water. And that vessel floated on the water, while all the oxen and elephants and camels and asses sank to the bottom with all the animals, so that I could no longer see them. 
and they were not able to escape, but perished and sank into the depths. And again, I saw in the vision till those water torrents were removed from that high roof and the chasms of the earth were leveled up and other abysses were opened. Then the water began to run into these till the earth became visible, but that vessel settled on the earth and the darkness retired and light appeared. I'm in the process of trying to take the descriptions given in the canonized text along with what we can read in books like Enoch and other writings contemporary with the biblical text, which clearly illustrate the worldview of the biblical authors, and creating a 3D model, taking these descriptions as literally as I can. This is still very much a work in progress. The following is what I've come up with so far. And I've been working in a, a 3D software program. And, uh, you know, this isn't like a real expensive program. And uh, I don't have a really super powerful computer or anything like that. So, you know, it, it's not like avatar quality 3D or anything like that, but it gets the point across. Um, this is a, a sort of a new model that I've been working on of uh, Yahuwah's terrarium as conceptualized uh, by me based on the descriptions in the ancient text. So this is uh, the whole heaven and earth system right here. Thick clouds are covering over him, and he seeth not, and he walketh in the circuit of heaven. That's Job 22.14 in the King James Version. The King James 2000 Version says, circle of heaven. The New American Standard Bible says, a vault of heaven. So basically, this is like a vault right here that has a circular walking path right here. The above shows the complete heaven-earth system, essentially as a vault, depicting the floor of Yahuwah's throne room atop the firmament, which is his footstool. Essentially, the idea is that the circle of heaven upon which Yahuwah walks is surrounding the top of the dome. His throne would be toward the back, be back here, which would be uh, the north end of this setup. The four corners, right here, uh, where Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Fenuel stand are the four edges of the gold-plated floor of the throne room of heaven in this model. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree, Revelation 7.1. The book of Enoch goes into a fair amount of detail concerning these four angels who stand on the four corners of the earth. I'll write more about that later in my blog concerning angels. Now, this is, of course, the typical model of the earth that we're all used to seeing, the globe model. Now, even though the word earth, eretz in Hebrew, means land, it occurred to me that if we can consider the atmosphere, clouds, ocean, and land collectively— all of this, not just the land, as Earth, meaning the whole Earth system as in the globe model depicted above here, then I suppose we could apply the same logic to the entire system depicted in my 3D model. In other words, the entire compartment depicted there could be the quote-unquote Earth system. Thus, if true, then the four corners don't have to be part of the circle of the Earth below, but rather they could be part of the roof above the system within the heavenly realm surrounding the throne, which looks down on the earth, land, below. If true, then this causes a departure from views such as this one. Now, this is the one that I've pretty much held to uh, when I first started looking into this anyway, as uh, a pretty good uh, depiction showing how a circle could be inscribed, as it says in the Bible, inscribed. The circle's not just there. It was inscribed, cut into something. But we also know, of course, the Bible describes as having four corners. So to me, it's not rocket science to imagine that a circle could be carved into something square or rectangular. And uh, somebody else, apparently back in the 1800s, had a very similar idea. They drew this depiction here. Of course, I don't see any evidence for this sort of roulette table, kind of roulette wheel looking thing here. Um, and as far as my investigations go, I don't see ev evidence of curvature either way, convex or concave. So I didn't really like that part of this, but the idea of a circle and a square, this is what I had previously considered uh, biblically possible. <clears throat> but I'm kind of taking a different view of that now. Um, I, now, I'm not being dogmatic about any of this. I fully acknowledge 
this is pure speculation on my part, okay? <laughs> I'm just, you know, thinking outside the box here and trying to do my best uh, with the information provided to depict the stuff visually in a way consistent with the text. This is very much still a work in progress, but the images below are cutaway views looking into the interior of the heaven earth system, you know, that I have depicted here. So I'm just kind of cutting away and looking into it. <clears throat> this is what I'm coming up with here. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Have you ever noticed that water is never described as having been created? It's just there immediately after the declaration that God created the heavens and the earth. In many ways, this model helps reconcile something about which I've always struggled. The word for heaven is shamaim. The King James should read heavens. It says right here, God created the heaven. I know a lot of people out there saying, oh, you know, there's, there's the heaven first, and then there's the heavens. The problem is, in Hebrew, the same exact word is used uh, wherever you see it as, as plural, heavens. Same exact word, shamaim. The I am indicating a plurality uh, or duality, as some would say. Um, more than one, at any rate. So, you know, I don't know why King James decided to put heaven there for the exact same word that is elsewhere translated as heavens, but whatever. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, the word for heaven is shamaim, which includes the word maim, which is the word for water. And some scholars have suggested that heaven thus means something akin to water in it. That could be one of the ways you could interpret it, like as if it's a... Uh, like a compound, like it's like a compound word, um, heaven with water in it, or heaven meaning water in it. But I've always wondered how that would work. Well, this model seems to answer that question, at least for me anyway. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Genesis 1, 6 through 8, in the King James. In my cutaway view, note that there is water beneath the throne of Yahuwah, inside an enclosed system, collectively known as earth. This system has a firmament, dome, right here, separating the water above from the water below, forming essentially a bathysphere, an enclosure of air, within which the dry land appeared in the Genesis 1 account. And we are told that uh, that circle of the earth was inscribed, carved into, cut into the deep. So that's what I've got depicted here. Being that this water-surrounded earth system is literally under the throne of Yahuwah in heaven, this shows how the water is in it, water in it, water in heaven. I'm thinking that during the flood, some of that upper water was drained into the enclosure, filling it enough to cover all of the dry land. I say some because over a thousand years after the flood, King David wrote, Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Psalm 148.4. So he's still saying there's waters above the heavens. So you know, maybe it was full all the way up to the top, you know, right into this, uh, these openings. I, you know, this is a creative license. Obviously, I'm taking artistic license here, but, you know, maybe the water was all the way up. But enough of it drained in to flood the earth. And so, you know, there's a, a decrease in uh, the water above, but there's still water above. Now, something that I used to talk about a lot when I used to teach creation uh, using the materials of people like Kent Hoven and Carl Baugh and others and, and some of my own ideas inserting into the text, uh, you know, uh, the, the belief that the firmament was essentially a, a canopy of ice that surrounded the world. And at the flood, that canopy was broken up and um, disintegrated and, and essentially rained down on earth. I taught that for many years. There are other people who teach uh, similar ideas on that. Um, but that's not what the text says. Regardless, I think most people who study the creation account and look at the archaeological record 
will acknowledge that everything was bigger before the flood. I mean, like dragonflies are huge, you know. Uh, it seems like uh, just about everything got bigger. Um, and when they drilled into amber and, and took samples out of air bubbles, it had uh, uh, more pressure than we have in our current atmosphere and uh, more oxygen saturation than we currently have. So it was a pressurized, oxygenated environment, uh, more so than it is now. And the thought occurred to me in this model that, you know, when you go underwater, I mean, even submarines have a limit as far as how far they can go down before their hull is crushed under the pressure of the water above them. So if this water was uh, at a higher level before the flood, then there would have been more pressure in the bathysphere. And the scriptures describe the firmament as metallic, like uh, molten metal. Uh, some say beaten down brass or what have you. Uh, metallic at any rate. Uh, but whatever the case may be, whatever it's made out of, it's acting like a bathysphere with water above it, which means there would be pressure on the interior of it, just like you'd have like in a submarine. Um, so you'd have an, that increased pressure before the flood would uh, decrease after the flood if the water level was dropped down because there'd be less water above it to to cause that pressure. And if opening up the windows of heaven cause some of that oxygen content to leave and plants aren't getting as big as they used to because when they were getting really big, they were able to put off a lot more oxygen than they're able to do now. So it seems to me that that would make a logical explanation for the change in the atmospheric conditions after the flood in this model. Uh, we had a totally different idea when, whenever we talked about uh, the pre and post flood world with the canopy of ice theory. So uh, just something to consider. I'm, I'm starting to, you know, as I look at all the old material that I used to teach and read and study, uh, of course, in a globe model and trying to kind of reconsider it in something like this. And it's starting to make a lot more sense. And if it's like this, too, you'll notice that in the, uh, the way I have this sort of divided, I have like a dark the divi division of light and day. Maybe there was a dark matter of some sort that was put there for the nighttime side and maybe more of a clear uh, environment for the daytime side. And when the sun shines up into the canopy uh, that has water above it, you have blue skies. I don't know. Just playing around with ideas here. Um, I'm sure the scientists would laugh at that and say there's a whole other reason why the sky is blue, and you know maybe that's true. But I just when I rendered the model out and saw what, what it did to the water here, I thought, well, that's interesting. Kind of a blue sky right there, but what have you, you know, whatever. Just some interesting observations, put it that way. Okay, so there still is water above us. Peter seems to also confirm this when he writes in 2 Peter 3, 5, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So you see the earth out of the water and yet still in the water. It would appear that when the windows of heaven were opened, only enough of the water above necessary to fill the bottom of the enclosure up to 15 cubits, or about 20 feet above the highest mountain, according to Genesis 7.20, was released. No more than that was needed to do the job. I mean, you don't need to fill the whole thing up uh, if you're just going to flood uh, the land portion to about 20 feet over the mountains, and you just need enough of the water above to fill that up right there. And we see in Psalm 33, 7, He gathered the waters of the sea together as an heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. So my theory on this is, you know, where does the water go? Is that it was then drained out basically like a bathtub and perhaps into the storehouses of the deep, which I've depicted as these box-like structures inside the, um, inside the walls there. So if you can imagine, you know, these are... Uh, you know, all the way around, you know, these kind of storehouses, you know, that, that if, if, you know, this whole thing is filled up, I mean, I've got to cut away here so you can see it, but I mean, if the whole thing's filled up and some of that water goes in there, if you just drain it into this, then it just, you know, it doesn't really go anywhere. You, you, you're not changing the water level much. Um, so it have to have another place to go. And so that's why I imagine these sort of uh, 
containers where the runoff could have gone to uh, the storehouses of the deep, so to speak. We see in First Samuel 2.8, I've got this kind of subdued uh, imagery here, kind of looking like x-ray vision. Into I've got sort of this x-ray vision view here looking in so you can see the pillars of the earth there. Uh, because we see in First Samuel 2.8, he raises up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon them. World set on pillars. You will also note in the cutaway, I have depicted the pillars of the earth. I have created them with essentially shock absorbers at the top. This would certainly allow for the earth to be shaken up as needed in Yahuwah's wrath, but yet still remain firm as a whole. Because there are scriptures that talk about the earth you know, being moved to and fro like a drunkard. Um, and, and scriptures like this right here, uh, Job 9, 1 through 6, uh, beginning of verse 1, it says, Then Job answered and said, I know it is so of a truth, but how should man be just with God? If he will contend with him, he cannot answer him, one of a thousand. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered? Which removeth the mountains, and they know not. Which overturneth them in his anger. Which shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble. So, you know, if you can imagine the earth being kind of shook up a little bit uh, with, with sort of like these shock absorber things. Here's a better example right here. You know, that would give the opportunity. I mean, and maybe that's how the earth, you know, I'm just kind of looking at this right now and wondering if this has a, uh, a, a slow cycle of a, a minor sway to it. You know, uh, one of the ends kind of goes up and down slowly. Uh, that may explain the tides, maybe. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just guessing, just kind of winging it here, just kind of thinking out loud. But something like this would certainly allow for the earth to remain firm on its pillars, but still have the ability to shake it up uh, from time to time as, uh, as needed. With the floor of heaven and containing walls removed, we see the earth standing in the water and out of the water, as Peter described, set atop pillars, firm and unmovable. Again, this is all speculation, but it is at least putting a visual together for me of the things I've been reading in the canonized and biblically endorsed extra biblical texts. One thing is certain, though. The book of Enoch is certainly a slam dunk for the enclosed world flat earthers. I mean, you, you can't get around it as, as, you're, as you're reading through the book of Enoch. That's what you end up with. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? Isaiah 66, 1. And somebody had posted this picture of a footstool on my Facebook. And I thought, wow, how amazing is that? they posted this after I was already building this model. <laughs> I was like, yeah, look at that. And in fact, even if you see if I can um, zoom in on this here. Yeah. Look at the way this uh, craftsmanship on this wooden uh, footstool is. It's got these ridges here and everything. Kind of crazy. Uh, I'm kind of looking at that going, is, is this confirmation or is this just one of those, you know, coincidences, right? I don't know. But we see verses talking about that the earth is his footstool, right? Uh, that one right there in Isaiah 66, 1. And we see in Matthew 5, 35, But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. In Acts chapter 7, verse 49, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is a footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? And uh, it looks like that's uh, Stephen quoting the words of Isaiah there, paraphrasing a little bit. Okay, so uh, that's the reason why I've got sort of this overall depiction here. Uh, heaven is his throne, it's the throne room. He walks in the circle of heaven, and the earth system below with the firmament is his footstool. That's sort of the uh, idea I'm going for there. No question about it. The ancient texts clearly describe Yahuwah's footstool as essentially a snow globe with the still flat circular earth set on pillars under a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars were placed on day four 
of creation. But the question I'm now wondering about is, are there more of these types of systems out there? Uh, the scripture popped into my head, John 14, 2, where Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. The Greek word there is mone, I think is how you pronounce that, uh, which means dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Uh, I had an interesting conversation with Matt Boylan uh, on Facebook, and he doesn't buy the enclosed model idea. He believes in the infinite plane that just keeps going on forever and ever and ever. And if we can get past the security and everything in Antarctica and just keep going, that we'll eventually find another pocket, sort of like this egg crate, you know, with all these different circular worlds, you know, just going on forever. And I said, well, you know, I find your idea interesting. And when, when I, whenever I try to talk about the enclosed world, uh, like Mark Sargent talks about, he, he, his response was, well, you have a very small God, you know, that's not very impressive. And well, you know, I kind of see his point, but who's to say there aren't millions of these. What if there, what if this is just one cube and there's cubes going off forever that way and that way and that way and that way. And, you know, he's got many of them. Uh, who knows? There's, I mean, Outside of this system, assuming this system is accurate, there's a lot of space. Who knows what's out there? So I don't have any problem believing that there could be another one right next door on all four sides. And it just keeps going, you know. The, so the infinite plane idea, the egg crate idea, uh, still works, at least in my mind, if you put a dome over it. Uh, but the difference would be it, you can't get to the other ones. Now, Matt seems to think that we could get to the other ones. I tend to think that... Um, based on the ancient record, and I told him this, is you know, biblically speaking, there's this firmament thing you can't get around, and it's in a lot of ancient texts, and not just from the Hebrews. Other people had very similar ideas. So, um, you know, we can't just ignore the entire ancient record. If we're going to subscribe to any of this stuff, then we, we got to look at this evidence objectively. And so, uh, at least for me, I can't get around it. So, if th there is an infinite plane with other worlds out there, then if they're constructed the same way as ours is, then there's domes over all of them. And, you know, could that be why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Who knows what he's got out there? Who knows what he has prepared for us? Right now, all I can do is sit here and say things that make you go, Hmm.